if this is your first time here, we have been taking about three months to study through the book of Daniel. We have this week and one more week. The book of Daniel is uh, an unusual book. It's unusual because it's a book that we will uh, take to our children and read some of the most famous stories that have ever been written, stories like Daniel in the lion's den and the statue made of gold and the writing on the wall. But it's also a book that's debated by scholars because it deals with four very complex visions. And the, the book starts off very uh, sequentially and, and it's easy to read. But when you get to chapter 7, Daniel goes back and he starts... Uh, chronicling some of the visions that he's received during his ministry. And these visions are filled with apocalyptic imagery. And, and honestly, they're really somewhat confusing to understand. But regardless of whether you're reading in the first part of Daniel, which we're familiar with, or the last part of Daniel, which is a little more complex, one of the things that you find in the book of Daniel is Daniel makes a priority of prayer throughout the book. In chapter 2, you see him praying to God and enlisting his friends' prayers as he sought to understand the vision that God had given to, or the dream that God had given to Nebuchadnezzar. When we get to chapter 6, we learn that Daniel's prayer life was that he would pray three times a day. He would get up, he would pray at the noontime, he would pray at evening, and it was a regular part of his practice. He's continuing this practice when we get to Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, we have a written record of one of his prayers. And so that's uh, uh, what we're going to see uh, uh, today is that written record of his prayer. But when he is in the middle of praying, an angel shows up, the angel Gabriel, and taps him on the shoulder, I guess, and tells him, hey, I've got a vision that I want to share you with you. But he says these words, Daniel, as soon as you started praying, as soon as your prayers lifted up into the heavens, an answer went out from that. And I've come to give it to you, for you are treasured by God. Boy, I, I, I love that, that God treasures his people, that he loves us, that he hears our prayers, and he answers our prayers. And this is constant. It didn't just happen in the life of Daniel. It happens in the life of all of his people. And God promises us this. In Jeremiah chapter 33, he says, Call unto me, and I will answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things that you can't possibly understand. Jesus' teaching affirms the need for us to call unto God. He says, I ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The early church continued to teach that prayer should be a vital part of our lives and we should believe in the power of prayer. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he says, This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. In chapter 9, we're going to see uh, why uh, Daniel's prayers were answered and we're going to learn uh, while we can trust God to, to hear our prayers. So if, if you have your Bibles, open up to Daniel chapter 9, follow along. I'll have most of the scriptures up here, uh, but if, uh, if, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to follow along. The first thing that happens is we get a time stamp. In the first year of Darius, this is when this is happening, and verse 2 tells us that, uh, that Daniel is is reading the books according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, what's interesting about the calling Jeremiah the word of the Lord is Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel. Uh, he was older than Daniel, but he was writing when Daniel was still in Jerusalem before he was exiled. But almost immediately, Jeremiah's words are seen as the word of God because he predicted something and it happened. And so they had his words, and the exiles read his words often. And in particular, Daniel is reading about uh, the, the number of years of desolation or destruction of Jerusalem. They're limited. There are only going to be 70 of these. And we know there's a good possibility that he's reading from Jeremiah 25, verse 11, that this whole land will become a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Or perhaps uh, he is reading from Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will restore you to this place. I will tend to you. I'll confirm my promise. And you'll come back 
to Jerusalem. Now, Daniel reads these words. Think about this. He's been in exile, and he reads these words about restoration, and he starts begging God. God, make this happen. Please give us this, God. We want to go home. And he starts to to pray. And and, and verse 3 tells us that as he starts to turn his attention to the Lord and seek him by prayer, he does so with a posture that is filled with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Now, if you read your Bible, you've come across this threefold litany. Fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. It's in Kings. You see it in Job. uh, You see it even some in the Psalms. Uh, let me, let me just take a second to tell you what this is. Fasting, most of us recognize, that's withholding food for some amount of time to prioritize something else. And usually that's something like prayer. That you're going to not eat for a little bit so that you can pray. Uh, that could be a day, it could be a meal, it could be three days. Whatever that period is, a person says, I'm going to withhold food and every time I'm hungry, I'm going to pray. You know, I, I fasted three days one time in my life. I prayed for two and a half days. I was hungry the whole time. Uh, but uh, uh, as you can tell, that's been a while ago. But uh, sackcloth is a rough material that they would put on their bare skin and wear. And this rough material would feel like a Brillo pad on their skin. And it was constantly irritating them. And and this sackcloth would remind them that they had done wrong and it should lead them to repentance. And it was a symbol of saying, God, I'm really sorry about what I've done. Ashes were not what you would think of like the Catholic Ash Wednesday on the forehead. It was typically an ash heap. And they would take ashes and even pour them on themselves to show that they were unworthy of, of God's favor and they were in complete ruin. This is the the posture of Daniel, and he's basically saying, God, I'm I'm just nothing on my own. This response gives a clear indication, I believe, why God answers his prayer quickly. Because God always answers the prayer of a humble person. God, God is attentive to the humble. And there's a few things that led to Daniel's humility. Number one, he just understood the awesomeness of God. Uh, Listen to how the prayer begins in in verse 4. He he says in verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and I confess, oh God, you are great and you are awe-inspiring. You keep your gracious covenant with those who love you and you keep your commands. You're this great, awesome God. He just knew there was something different and bigger and other than us about God. He understood that there's a clear creator-creation distinction. And when you remember this, that God is the center of the universe and you're not, and when you recognize that he's the prime mover of the universe and, and that he spins the planets and creates the galaxies and establishes all of our days, and when you think about the fact that he knows every detail of your life and everybody's life who've ever lived, who are living, or who will live, when you think about the magnitude of God, that should blow your mind. His bigness and his otherness should lead us to humility. Have you ever seen somebody meet someone famous and they freeze up? Have you, have you ever met somebody who you th- thought was really, really important and you didn't know what to say, you didn't know how to talk, you were awkward in the moment? You know, they seem so important. They have so much money. So many people think they're popular. You know, I, I, and I know that would happen in here. There would be some people whose minds would be blown if Taylor Swift showed up in our congregation for one reason or another, you know. Or, or if Reed Shepherd were to show up in our congregation and he was out in the hallway, there would be people who felt led to go to the bathroom to get in line to get his autograph. I know how this would go down. Here's what I want you to see. We are so impressed at people who look kind of like us or who we want to look like. 
And yet every day the God of the universe calls us to get in his presence and to talk to him. The God who is in control of all things has said, I want to know you. I, I, want, to, I want to be with you. And we're just a speck on this small speck in the middle of this vast universe. And he says, I want to know you. That should affect our attitude when we pray. But during my lifetime, there's been a concerted effort to deformalize prayer. And, and I get it. And, you know, the Bible says we're to commune with God as friend and we're to enter into his presence boldly and, and we should have conversation with God. If you ask me, how do you pray? I usually say, just start talking to God. You know, just, just start talking. But somewhere, I feel like we have kind of crossed the line to, in informality and have adopted this completely casual posture in prayer. You know, people say, hey, God, what's up? I hope your coffee's good this morning. You know, like, that's stupid, okay? You're talking to the God of the universe who has called you before his throne to conversation with him. Yes, we talk to him as friend to friend, but he's still God. When we pray, Jesus said, our Father who art in heaven, you know the next line? Hallowed be your name. You, you're, you're, you're bigger than I am. You, you are to be honored and respected. There should be a reverence and a familiarity in our prayer life. Humility is the result of realizing that he is this God who's awe-inspiring and great and above all. But humility in prayer also is developed when we recognize that we're not that. We understand who we are and how sinful we are. The bulk of Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9 is filled with confession. I just want to highlight it for you. Verse 5, he starts out, he says, we've sinned. But not only have we sinned, we've done wrong. And we, it's bigger than that. We've acted wickedly and we've rebelled against you and, and turn from your ways and, and what you've commanded and you've ordained. We've just acted like it didn't matter. And then he says in verse 6, we didn't listen to the prophets who told us the truth. And then in verse 7, he said, we weren't faithful to you. We weren't loyal to you. And he repeats in verse 8, we've sinned against you. Again, in verse 9, he says, we've rebelled against you. In verse 10, he says, we haven't obeyed the voice of the Lord. Daniel knows that the exile that's come on the people of Israel that the Babylonians brought on them was deserved. He knows that destruction of the temple, of the walls, of the city was warranted. He's aware that the problems he's faced, trouble with the kings and being thrown into lion's dens, he understands that all of that is the result of the sin of God's people. In verse 11, he says, all Israel's broken your law. All Israel has turned away. And by the way, that sounds like a New, ver New Testament verse to you. For all have sinned. Every person. None of us can point the fingers at others and say they are sinners without acknowledging that first that we ourselves are filled with sin and we refuse to obey God. And because of this, a promised curse came upon them at that particular time. They sinned against God and his wrath was poured out verse 12 it says he carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that's so great that nothing like it has been done to Jerusalem nothing like what's been done to Jerusalem I'm just not aware of it now maybe this is hyperbolic language uh, but he's saying it's really bad this is really really bad and he said we we made the mess and we deserve it you know, when we're asking God to help us and when we're praying for God's deliverance, one of the things that we have to do is acknowledge that we really don't deserve for him to listen. Daniel confesses his sins and we have to do the same. Our behavior, our motives, our attitudes, our emotions, our conversations, our thoughts, all of those things would disqualify us from asking God anything ever. I, I know it would for me. If, if God kept record, which he does, of every time that I've complained or every time that I've been critical or of someone that he created or every time I took a blessing for granted 
or every time that I act so, acted selfishly, if that ledger cost me a prayer, I would be in an insurmountable deficit. I would have no right to ask God anything. That's why we proclaim here at, at Porter and in any Christian church that the only right that we have to come before God in prayer is his mercy gives us that right. His grace gives that to us. My coming before God is, is purely a gift, and that should make me humble. I can't demand of God. Say, where are you? Why haven't you? Why didn't you? I just can't go there. And on top of that, God doesn't listen. Jesus told a story about two men who went to the temple to pray. You remember the story? One guy goes to the temple, and he's dressed to the nines, and he looks good on the outside. He comes from the right side of the tracks. He did the exterior things right, and he prayed, and he said, God, aren't you glad you got me? I give you so much. I do the right thing so often, and I'm not like that guy over there, the guy who is sinful and dirty and corrupt. And Jesus said, the other guy prayed, oh God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I've done so many wrong things. I don't even deserve to talk to you. God, would you please be merciful to me, a sinner? And Jesus asked a question, who do you think God listened to? Who do you think went home justified? Was it the person who was proud or was it the person who was humble? If you want your prayers to be heard, at some point, you've got to own it. God's God, you're not, and you're not as good as you were created to be. That's the starting point for prayers being heard, and that's what's going on with Daniel's life. But before we move forward, did you notice how Daniel includes himself as part of the problem? You read this text, and he doesn't just say, those people, those sinners, that guy. Daniel says, we, I, we have sinned. And that's odd when you think of Daniel's story from the get-go. He's been faithful. At every turn, he's seeking God, standing up for what's right, preaching the truth. And yet he takes responsibility for something that he's not done, at least not to the same extent of others. But that's kind of a mark of maturity, isn't it? We, immature people blame people for their problems. They pray, God, fix those people. If that person wasn't in my life, if my kids didn't have that, that's how they pray. Mature people, mature believers, own their part of the problem, and they accept responsibility for seeking solutions. And Daniel does his part. He intercedes on behalf of the Jewish people, and he asks God to deliver them. In verse 15, he says, Now, Lord our God, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt. You've done it before, God. We have sinned. We've acted wickedly. But God, would you keep with your righteousness and, and, and turn your wrath and anger away from Jerusalem? God, would you, would you restore uh, you, uh, your, your sanctuary? Would you hear my prayer? Would you listen, God? In verse 18, he says, listen, please. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. You see, God said that he would return his people and now Daniel prays that God would do what he promised. I don't know about you, but when I look around our country, I would love for God to restore our country and restore this place. Do you ever look at the condition of this country and our community and our culture and grieve? Does it ever bother you? Sometimes the problems in our cities and the conflicts in our governments and the moral decline and the greed and the shamelessness and the disintegration of the family unit and the rejection of God, honestly, sometimes it's demoralizing. But my hope as a pastor is it would drive us to pray and to get involved more than it leads us to complain. Daniel believed that God could restore Israel, and he asked God to do just that, and he knew they didn't deserve it. He says in verse 18, as we continue, we're not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts. There's nothing we've done. We can't be good enough for you to answer our prayer, but we're asking you based on who you are, God. And he knew something else that's troublesome. Um, I didn't go over this in verse 13, but if you look in your Bible in verse 13, he, he says these words. 
just as, is, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us. You, you promised this would happen, and it did happen, and yet we still hadn't sought the favor of the Lord. We still hadn't turned for our, our iniquities. We, you know, we're not, still not paying attention to your truth. What, what Daniel realizes is that if God did take them back, they, it, it wouldn't fix their problem. They'd been promised that exile would come, and when it did, they didn't repent. They, the, the, they didn't turn to godliness. Uh, and Daniel had to be wondering, God, what good is it for you to take people back to Jerusalem? Because you know what's going to happen? They're going to act just like they did before they came here. Does that sound familiar? That man's heart is, is a problem. No matter how many second chances we get, men loop back to their sinful ways. And yet, nevertheless, Daniel asked, he says, God, would you, would you hear? Would you forgive? Would you listen? And would you act? And while he's praying, Gabriel, the man he had seen in a vision, I believe the angel Gabriel reaches to him in his extreme weariness in his third time of praying that day. And, and the angel tells him in verse 22 that he's going to give him some understanding. And then we read the verse that we looked at early on. He says, as soon as you started praying, God was answering. As soon as you started praying, God was responding to you because you are treasured by God. That word means he was God's prize. He was his, his, his trophy. He was loved by God. I, look, can we pause here for just a second and be honest? Daniel's life doesn't look very loved by God. He's been exiled. He, his city where he grew up was destroyed. He's been forced into labor, probably been castrated. He's lived under oppression. He's been betrayed by his co-workers. He's lived under constant danger. He served under several regime changes. And now he faces the normal problem of just becoming an old man. And the angel says, man, God loves you. God, God really loves you. I wonder how this landed on Daniel. He had prayed for deliverance. He had returned to his homeland for years. And my guess is he probably wondered if God loved him at all and if his prayers made any difference. And I don't know if Daniel wondered that at all, but I know you wonder it. And I know there's been times in my life that I've wondered it. When, when my plans or my timeline or my comfort gets threatened, sometimes I wonder, where are you, God? What Daniel reminds us here is that God's love for his people is not measured by life's ease. He has a plan, and it's good in the end, but it's good in his timing. And until his timing makes all things new and all things perfect, we're told to keep praying we're told to put one foot in front of the other, to do what is right, to love others, and to trust God. And that's what Daniel does. Verse 23, the angel shares with him a vision. Uh, he, he comes to give him insight of what God's doing, and, and he gets a vision that involves 70 weeks. Verse 24, he says, 70 weeks are decreed. God has established 70 weeks. We're moving into those murky waters again. It's been pretty clear thus far in Daniel 9. As we move into the end of Daniel 9, we find this confusing vision. Uh, one of the things that almost everybody agrees upon that these 70 weeks do not refer to 49 days, or wait, 490 days. Most people believe that they represent an extended period of time. Uh, this is not a year and a half in most people's minds. Some people believe it's this indefinite, long time that's symbolic of, uh, of something to come. I, I personally believe it's a little more specific than that. I believe that each day represents a year. And since there's seven days in a week, that would be seven years. And seven years times 70 would be 490 years. But regardless of what time frame you think it implies, I feel confident that the week's are referring to a time when Jesus is going to show up. In particular, he's going to show up the first time. Uh, we read on that he's going to come to bring rebellion to an end. 
Now, as we read about this, see if this sounds like when Jesus showed up in Jerusalem. He came to bring rebellion to an end. Those people who were his enemies were turned to friends. God loved us while we were his enemies, and Christ died for us so that we could be friends with God. He came to put an end to sin. Daniel's concern was they hadn't learned. Guys, we will never learn unless Jesus does a new work in our heart. The prophet Ezekiel said that God would take the heart of stone and he would give a heart of flesh. And that happened through what Jesus did for us on the cross. When we look to the cross beyond our goodness and our own merit and we put our trust in what he did for us and his righteous act on our behalf, at that moment our heart changes. And sinners who go back to the slop like a pig does are now transformed to start pursuing righteousness in Christ and live to be conformed to the image of God. But not only did he bring an end to rebellion and a stop to sin, he atones for iniquity. Through his death, he made atonement on our behalf. And now we have a permanent righteousness, an everlasting righteousness. We're not good because we showed up at church. And we're not good because we do charitable deeds every now and then. And we're not good because we keep commands. We're good because we trusted in the one who made a, a sacrifice for us that covers our sin once and for all. And we have complete righteousness in Christ. And we are holy before him forever. We have everlasting righteousness. The Bible says that he would seal up vision and prophecy. Jesus is God's last word. Paul tells us in Jesus all the promises of God received their yes and amen in Jesus. And Christ anointed the most holy place. There's debate over whether this word in Hebrew means place or person. But he anointed uh, that, that holy place. I personally believe that some people say that he anointed the holy person and made uh, a true and better Adam. He showed man how to live and he anointed the body and lived holy. I personally believe it's talking about the holy of holies here and picturing the mercy seat and the sacrifice of Jesus' blood was shed for us and it paid the price once and for all and he anointed that holy place and it has forever uh, uh, brought us righteousness with God. Um, Whatever you interpret that, can you see how this looks like it's pointing to the gospel of Jesus? Am I the only one who reads this and said, this looks like Christ? This looks like his righteousness. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, but what comes next is one of the most disputed passages in all the Bible. The next three verses have divided colleges and seminaries and denominations and brothers and sisters Pastors have quit talking to each other over these next three verses because almost everybody disagrees on them or with them. Um, let's dig in. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. I'm pretty good at math, and that makes 49 weeks. You, or 69 weeks. I'm real good at math. <laughs> I'm better at math than I am public speaking. <laughs> but it makes 69 weeks, which would be 483 years. Okay? Uh, if you were to use the Jerusalem cal or the Jewish calendar, uh, there's 460 days in a year instead of 465 days, it would be slightly less than that. There's a lot of debate over what this points to. I have no doubt that this anointed one is referring to Jesus' first coming, his initial coming. Now, as with the whole book, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on numbers because I'm struggling up here. Uh, but this is a, a vision of 70 weeks, but he just talks about 69. What gives? Well, why just 69 weeks? Um, well, it's, it's pointing to when the anointed one would come. Here's what's interesting to me is the, even those who agree with the math like I'm doing don't agree. What is the issuing of the decree? There's about five options. The two primary is when Cyrus decreed that the people could come back. And the other, I believe, is more accurate when Nehemiah was given the go-ahead to come and rebuild the wall. I think this is a reference. It will be rebuilt with a plaza, a temple that was already being rebuilt, and a moat a wall around the area, a barrier around the area that he sees in this vision. 
even if you disagree with me in that, uh, I'm all right with it. Uh, but, but anyhow, he, he, he sees this as 69 weeks that are going to happen. If it is from Nehemiah's time, and it's uh, roughly 470 to 475 years using the Jewish calendar, it would coincide with the time that Jesus did his public ministry and that he was crucified uh, for us. Now, this is predicted in the next verse when he says, after those 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Uh, now, there's even more disagreement over the rest of the vision. There's not much left, but here's where the fighting really starts. It says the people of the coming ruler. This is not talking about the anointed one. It's talking about a different ruler. The anointed one brings righteousness and, and healing and end of sin. The, the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end will come with the flood. And until the end there will be a war. And, and desolations will be decreed. Some people see this as the Antichrist in uh, chapter 7 that we talked about a few weeks ago. The one who would be at the end that would be done away with when the Son of Man comes riding on the clouds. Other people see it as the spirit of the Antichrist, like we saw in chapter 8, with uh, referring to Antiochus Epiphanes and, and those smaller iterations. Uh, either way, what's being taught here is the evil one is not going to have reign forever. This coming ruler, he will meet his demise. He... he it has been decreed that destruction will be poured out on the desolator, on the one that brings the problems. Guys, there's lots and lots of ambiguity in this text. How long is that final week? Does it happen between Jesus' death and his second coming? Does it happen from when the Antichrist shows up and the end of time? Lots of ambiguity and uncertainty. And it's not wrong to want to figure out the details. That's not wrong at all. But you know what is wrong? To not have humility. I don't think that it was an accident that this is put at the end of this prayer that epitomizes humility. I've watched people use their theory of the end times to bludgeon people and to treat brothers like they're not brothers. All week, I have been trying to decide which way do I believe about this? I've changed my mind like four times this week, and I've reserved the right to change my mind before the end of the night. And I will probably continue to bounce back and forth until the time that Jesus comes again, because I'm not certain, but I will tell you this, I am certain of two things in this text. The first thing I'm certain of is Christ has come. He came to pay the price for sin, and I am certain that he is coming again to get rid of the evil one once and for all. And because of this, I am assured that there is forgiveness for my sin. Unlike Daniel's peers, I'm not hopelessly stuck in the spin cycle of sin. I have a Savior. And knowing this should increase my confidence in Him. And it should make me want to pray more, not less. I'm loved by God. Guys, God didn't hold anything back to save me. My sin was every bit as bad as the people that are referenced by Daniel. Every bit as bad. And yet my Savior loved me anyway. And he loved you too. And if the God who didn't spare his only son gave him up so that you could be right with him, don't you think he will answer prayers that are offered in humility that are said according to his will? Of course he will. Verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10 says, because of the blood of Jesus, we can come boldly before the, the throne of God. I can make my request known and my desires known. I can ask and God hears. And sometimes I see the answer right away. And sometimes God says no. And sometimes I feel like God says not yet. And sometimes when I pray, I don't hear anything. I mean, that's honest. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's not now. Sometimes... It's not for you to know. But when God calls me to pray, 
I know he's called me to keep praying. Daniel was 69 years in captivity. And he prayed three times a day. Seems to be every day, three times a day. Some of us get mad if we pray 30 seconds and God doesn't answer in the next 30 minutes. I pray that we would be more humble than that and that we would not give up. And if your path that God has put you in is one of hardship and holding on, this chapter reminds us that that just as, as sure as Christ came the first time, he will come again and there will be a time that is an end of your troubles. But until then, keep praying, keep being humble, keep trusting God. He will be faithful to his word and he's working all things toward a great outcome. It just might not be yet. Hold on. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and for the opportunity to share your word. Lord, I ask that you would, Lord, convince your people of your faithfulness to us. You hear our prayers because you love us. And God, when we don't see the answers right away, I pray that we would be faithful to continue to trust you. Lord, you've proven trustworthy by what you've already done for us. God, help us to have faith that you will take care of your own. Lord, I ask that if there's anybody here who needs, Lord, a touch from you today, I pray, Father God, that you would give it to them through the Holy Spirit. 